This podcast is brought to you with the kind support of Harborview Equity Partners. Harborview Equity Partners is a global investment firm focused on opportunities in the entertainment and media space. Founded by Cherise Clarkshors, Harborview is a long-term investor in content with an industrial platform built to protect, optimize, and enhance the legacy of premium IP. With a vision of becoming a true stakeholder in the global value of content, Harborview believes creators deserve a seat at the table creatively and economically, owning their narrative and maximizing value for all. In celebration of our partnership with Harborview Equity Partners, we have chosen a separate piece of music for each podcast in Series 1. We hope you enjoy it. Our next guest transitioned from a passion for archaeology into another long-term oriented pursuit, financial planning, with a particular focus on tech workers and sex workers. She's also an important voice in drawing our attention to the lack of female representation and the problem with female representation when it comes to matters of money. Find out why next. Ethan David, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Jessica Guttel, who is a financial planner and owner at Pavilion Financial Planning in Allentown, Pennsylvania. She works in particular for tech workers and sex workers, and I came across her profile when she presented a robust challenge to a popular personal finance book, highlighting its lack of female representation in its case studies. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Let's start by talking about your career journey, starting with where you grew up and what you studied. Yeah. Oh, that's a wild ride. So I got my degree in classics and ancient Mediterranean studies. And just to overdo it, I got a Latin minor as well and a focus on archaeology. So, and here I am as a certified financial planner 15 years later. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I wanted to be when I grew up was an archaeologist. And that was something that was a big driver for me for a really long time. And if I could do anything different, I'd probably go back to it. I still have that. My heart is still in history and, and digging in the dirt a little bit. I'm really interested, not the first ex-archaeologist or ex-wannabe archaeologist I've had on this podcast. For some, it was the field trips and the kind of the long days out in the elements that put them off. But I'm sure there are some traits that you learned in studying the classics and studying archaeology that you still refer to today. Can you think of any of those, maybe? Well, yeah, if, if you've been in the field at all, in the archaeology field, it is a slog. Um, <laughs> it's, it can get hot and you're doing a lot of repetitive work. But then there's that little nugget that you dig up and it just it makes everything worthwhile. And sometimes I think that financial planning is like that. I don't know if I call my work a slog. It's probably a bit more interesting than <laughs> digging the dirt for eight hours, but being able to work with clients and go through the process and know that we're going to get to some treasure at the end is what keeps me going, being able to help people. And I would also think that since most of planning involves very long-term thinking, you having been schooled in the very, very long term, maybe have a, a sense of maybe the arc of human experience as well as the discipline of staying long-term. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't realize about archaeology is that there's a lot of planning that goes involved. It's not like you just go and stick your shovel or, or trowel in the dirt. You actually have to think about where you're going, you know, be very measured in the process of what you're doing. And it's not as instant gratification. And financial planning is like that. <laughs> you have to think about where you're going, what are you doing, what are you trying to find, but then also being open to the things that you find on along the way that you weren't expecting. Then how did you end up in financial planning after studying this classics and archaeology major? That's a great, although somewhat depressing question for me, but I'm very open about it. I just didn't get into grad school. They didn't really tell you that you have to take time off after you graduate from college. I just wanted to go right into it and get right into grad school. And after a couple of rejection letters, I realized that maybe I had made a mistake. <laughs> so the way that I ended up getting here was a bit long. You know, I took a couple of jobs out of college, did some different things. But what really drew me here was becoming an adult having to make a budget, having to think about retirement and where do I save my money? And I had a family that really encouraged me to take control of my money and be curious about it. 
So I spent a lot of time reading personal finance blogs and books, and I was really intrigued by the whole process, but didn't really think about it as a career until I ended up leaving a job that I didn't like. And I thought about, well, what could I do if I wanted to pick a new career? I had an opportunity to pivot my life. And I kept thinking about being a financial planner. It just really excited me and ended up going for it and have a look back. It's really interesting how engaged you were and how interested you were in your own personal finances, because I think that seems to be one of the biggest barriers to getting more people on board with this, the importance of this, whether it's planning or or their pension in another context, is that lack of engagement, that lack of interest. How do you try to bridge that gap with your clients today? How do you generate a sense of it being important, interesting, stimulating material that they should be on top of? Honestly, I think it just comes down to providing a supportive environment where you can learn. I think that's what made the difference for me. I had a family that encouraged and supported my questions. And I see that the people that do want to take charge and understand this bit more have that curiosity, but that curiosity has to be fostered. So making it be a comfortable place where you can ask questions and think about your own future is really the thing that I find to be helpful for most people. And then when it came to setting up your own firm, was that always on the cards when you looked at financial planning or what was the thought process behind that? I think it was always there, kind of a little a little ember burning. <laughs> I've always thought about it. I've been in the industry for almost 10 years now. And I think it came to a head right after the pandemic, realizing I wanted to help a certain group of people, people that I understood better. And being able to do that in my way. I think I've always had a bit of an independent streak myself. And (laughs) I think that was always going to come to this point where I just, you know, I want to do the things that I want to do. I want to help the people that I want to help. And I want to do it the way that I want to do it. And I just kind of at the point where I didn't want to compromise anymore. And in terms of the actual mechanics of doing that, is there a lot of capital involved? Is it a big outlay, a big risk that you have to take? Or could you kind of ease in gradually? Yeah, it's it's not it's not a journey for everybody. It takes money. And it's more about having enough to set aside to pay your personal bills and your business expenses. And you can do it leanly and it can be tough. You you have to it takes a couple of years to really get to the point where you're back to your old salary. <laughs> and everybody's journey is a little bit different because I think it depends on what support st- structure you have and what your own expenses look like, how much you're willing to invest in your business, but it was a big leap. I'm very, very lucky that I have a very supportive family that helps me with this. Without them, I would not be able to do this. I, hands down, very, very fortunate. And then you spoke about the people you wanted to help. And in particular, in your bio, you speak about working with tech workers and sex workers in particular. How did you zero in on those two classes? And was it because you felt they were in some way underserved? Yeah, so each one's a little bit different on how I got there. When I was thinking about launching my own firm, it helps to have a very clear focus on who you want to work with. And being specific is really helpful. And I had the pleasure of working with a sex worker at a prior firm. And it was a very interesting way to think about planning the different challenges that she faced. And so when I thought about launching my own firm, I thought that would be a really interesting specialty to focus on. And then for tech workers, honestly, that's what I was used to. I know tech workers, I know their type of equity structure or compensation structure. And so I kind of went two pronged with it. You know, I went for the sex workers as being able to tell people in a way, I'm pretty open minded, I guess is probably the best way to put it. Right. You're not judging. You're not going to bring judgment to that conversation, right? Yeah. And it was a really clear way I could demonstrate that. But also, you know, being able to provide support to people who, frankly, I mean, everybody needs financial planning. But I think that sex workers in particular at the time when I launched my firm didn't really have a lot of resources for financial planning. And honestly, probably felt a bit judged if they would go to a traditional financial planner. And then, yeah, the tech workers, again, that's just, I know that stuff. That's my bread and butter. So I thought, well, may as well just put the two together. And uh, (laughs) I haven't had a regret yet. So it's always a different journey every day. I love it. And do you find that you tend to work more with women than with more women, say, as a percentage of your practice than some of your peers? Yeah, I would say so. I think that that just comes down to being a woman myself. I think that 
women have a couple hurdles as clients trying to find a financial planner. And as much as we wish it isn't this way, I think a lot of women do find that they'll go to a traditional financial planner that might be older and male, and they get talked down to, they are judged for things. And so when they see another woman, I think that there's an immediate relief of like, oh, okay, well, she understands. (laughs) And so I think just by that nature, I get a lot more women, but I also have quite a few male clients that, you know, have got some men who are extremely supportive of the women in their life. But I also think that they respect women in general. So yeah, my marketing material is not geared specifically to women, but I tend to get more women than than men. And just in terms of how the industry has evolved, say, over the last five years, what do you find now is top of mind for you in your conversations with clients? Has that changed over recent years? I think part of the past five years, I've had a dramatic shift. Obviously, since I launched my firm, I've had a shift in my client base. And so for me, it's it's been a fun challenge because the concerns that my clients have versus the clients that I worked with five years ago, we're talking about people in their 20s to 30s now versus working with people you know, maybe in their 60s to 80s five years ago. So the concerns that they have are just wildly different. <laughs> I obviously relate to the younger clientele more because I'm going through the same thing. So the, what they're worried about is a lot different. So I think the things that I've seen trending lately, it's housing is a major concern for a lot of people. You might even have your own house, but you're concerned what's going to happen over the next 10 years to your property value, or maybe you don't have a house and how are you going to be able to afford it? We've had a lot of shifts in that recently. I think that's been a, a big change. And how about, say, use of alternatives? Have you seen that spike or maybe interest in crypto? Although maybe we're a little late to the party in terms of that discussion, maybe that's already passed. Have you found like interests around the margin? Honestly, no. Most, again, most of my clients are coming to me. They're really thinking about their big picture. And I don't know. I know that a lot of other financial planners have clients that are interested in, in those alternatives. I don't know if it's just the way that my website is <laughs> geared, if those people, I just don't get those types of clients. I saw personally a big spike in interest in crypto because it's, it seems very tempting and different, lack of a better term, get rich quick investments. <laughs> but I think that's already quickly. <laughs> people are already thinking like, oh, maybe maybe let's back off on that a little bit, especially with like Robin Hood and stuff too. I think there's a lot of that in the past year and that's definitely gone by the wayside as well. Most that's of my definitely. clients are really on the long term. So got it. And then of course, it was you're a very passionate post about the point of diversity around diversity and the case studies we use, the way I suppose we we normalize women in finance that really attracted me to reaching out to you. So let's talk about that a little bit. So first of all, the podcast series speaks about diversity in the investment world. What's your experience of diversity within your field of financial planning? And do you think things are improving over the course of the time that you've been there? Oh, yeah. So I think my experience is probably pretty similar to a lot of women. I think we have to prove ourselves a little bit more. And again, I'm speaking completely from just a a white woman in the industry. I I try to pay attention to how other people are impacted, but I can't speak directly to that experience because it's not mine. And so one thing I have seen grow over time, which is really, I think, a great trend is that we are seeing a lot more diversity in the workspace, but it's nowhere, nowhere near enough. And back to kind of my original, how I got into this industry, I learned about it through a woman that had a radio show on financial planning and people would call in and ask her questions. And at that point, I didn't even know that you could do this as a profession, especially as a woman. And so having more people out there talking and like yourself hosting this podcast saying like, hey, as a woman, you can make it in this industry. You can do it. You know, It might be tough. It might be a slog and you might have to deal with some things that you don't want to deal with or should have to deal with, but it can be done. And so I think that there's been a lot more light shined on different women and different career paths in this industry. And I think it's going to take a long time for us to reap those rewards. But I think that it's a, a trend in the right direction. And let's talk now about some of your comments about a popular personal finance book and the narrative being skewed around males. And that's a problem because that gets back to this kind of identifying with women in finance or normalizing the role of a woman. This touches so many areas, whether it be women in financial roles or women's comfort with money or women's perceived risk tolerance. What have you seen and what do you think we get wrong in some of that? Yeah, I think in particular... 
The Psychology of Money, which is honestly a great book from the concepts that it, it tells people. But my struggle with it, among other things, was the lack of representation in that group. And the few references to women were not painted in a very good light. And I see a lot of conversations about this, that women are frivolous. They don't know about money and also just don't see a lot of success stories. Like this book could have focused on women's success stories in finance. There are a lot to choose from. And it's actually, I think the thing that I took away from that, that post the most was how many women actually reach out to me who had read the book. I didn't actually realize the lack of representation in it. And I thought that was the most telling thing of all was that we're trained to not notice this stuff. And I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know how this ultimately impacts you know, how women view themselves and what they think. But I think being able to talk about how money impacts all of us and leaving out half of society can't be a good thing. No, it's so interesting because I know there's been attempt to do this and maybe write the balance a little bit when it comes to, say, roles of heroes or examples, say, in politics, I've seen that. And yet she persisted book series that my daughters bring home from the library. And there's also a series called Gutsy Women. And I wonder if we did the same for women who've succeeded in finance and with money. I actually think it might be more compelling if we put it in a kind of a 50-50 sort of a curated set of men and women. Because Mm -hmm. when you sometimes put something as all women, well, then you only have the female readers sometimes and you just don't get that readership. But if you present it as 50-50 side by side, so maybe you and I will have to curate some of those stories. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that although I'm very grateful for gender-focused content out there, I think that as a society, we'll do better if we have that equal representation. And then that, that goes for everybody, not just women, men. I'm talking about people of color, different countries even. <laughs> you know, I tend to be very focused on US because that's kind of the sandbox that I play in. But there's a whole, what, 8 billion people out there now. So being thoughtful about the cultures that we come from and being a little bit more circumspect would be a great thing. And it's interesting because I still get asked the question frequently, are women more risk averse than men? As if all women would think the same way. And I, sometimes I find it, I'm torn because on the one hand, there are some conclusions you can draw based on the few women I know maybe who run funds or run money. And then again, it seems as counterintuitive a question as it will be to ask if all men have a strong risk appetite, because clearly women are going to all be different. Exactly. I think there's some comfort in we say things like, hey, women tend to be more risk averse and actually can pay off because we're kind of highlighting that there is some patterns that we can follow and lean into them a little bit more. But I think I try to avoid those statements because I know plenty of women that are much more risk tolerant than most, even some men. So I think generally we can, again, to your point, we can draw a lot of conclusions, but whenever we cast a group with one paintbrush, we don't learn from those those types of conversations. Well, thank you on my behalf, on the behalf of many women in the industry for starting that conversation and triggering, I think, the questions in our mind, because you're absolutely right. We have normalized for ourselves being one voice in a room of many. And I think it's just so important to be reminded that maybe that isn't the norm. <laughs> so um, so I think I look forward to seeing us uh, so seeing more of the same, whether from you or from other of our peers in the industry. I just have to get back to some personal reflections now. So you clearly had a, an interesting journey into financial planning and now building your own practice. Were there any key people in the industry or elsewhere in your life who influenced you and in what way? Oh, man, I've, I've just been so lucky that I've had a lot of people influence me. The first person I think of with that question is, is my mother. I wouldn't be the person today if it weren't for her. She was able to show what it was like to be a single mom, working hard, making not the decision that everybody tells you to make, but she always did her best. And that was something that I really took, I still take away from from my interactions with her is, you know, just living the life that you're comfortable with and and saying, okay, this is a decision I'm going to make and I'm going to stick with it because it's what I believe in. She'll be confused by this question, but I'll have to explain it to her later. But yeah, my mom, big shout out to her. And then I think my partner obviously has been really big support. But I think in this industry, again, I've had a couple of mentors that I've taken a lot of information from and female mentors, which has been really great. I've been very fortunate with that. And when you think about any words of advice you've received or any creed or motto 
you have lived by. And sometimes this can come from your clients as well as your peers, as well as family members or, or just other people you've encountered across the course of your career. Is there anything that you can share there? Yeah, the one that I could, that's just jumping out at me, but it might be kind of where the, the headspace I'm in right now, but it's eat the frog. So do the, <laughs> the thing that you're trying to avoid do that first thing in the morning. I know that's uh, not necessarily financial related, um, or it's just one of those pieces of advice that makes my life a lot easier. The understanding I need to get things done and get them off my plate and focus on delivering great financial planning to my clients and focusing on that as well. And if there was a formula that you'd say has led to your success in terms of getting your clients to engage, building that rapport, how do you approach that? Do you have a sort of goals orientation? Do you speak about purpose, mission, speak about long-term or fulfillment? What are the words that you use to, to build that relationship? I think one of the things I've always tried to bring to the table is I try to be myself on my website. You're getting the real me. I'm very open and honest about who I am. But so by the time somebody comes to me, I think they've got a good idea of who I am. So when I first talk to somebody, I just try to listen to them. I let them talk. I want to hear what's on their mind. It's the best way that I can learn is, you know, about somebody is have them tell me about themselves. I might ask a couple of questions, but I think that's very simple, but it's extremely powerful. Again, especially since most of my clients are women, they don't have a lot of people who listen to them. And so I really do try to just put my listening cap on and let them talk. Such an underrated skill and one we all, I think, need to do more of listening. It comes up time and time again in all of these podcasts. And my last question is around any advice you would have for your younger self, maybe that young archaeology student passionate about the ancient history. Is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known then? I think if I thought about it, I always think, what would I have done differently in my life? And I don't think there's anything I'd ever do differently. I've I've been so, so blessed to have a really just a great life. And there's obviously bumps in the road for a lot of people. But I think if I could give any advice to my younger self is enjoy those successes and, and your family and the things around you and absorb it. It's a wonderful place to be alive and be thriving in this world. And I try to appreciate that every day. And I would probably just encourage my younger self to do more of that. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. It was such a rewarding experience for me to reach out to you. I think it is quite a unique combination to bring that warmth and positivity with the really, I think, questioning that you do of the conventional narrative and maybe forcing us all out of our comfort zone to think differently and to challenge. And you certainly forced me to do that. And I think it's something that I will continue to do. And hopefully, thanks to this podcast, we will encourage others to continue to do that. And I really do mean it, that we need to start curating those female case studies to launch our own new narrative, maybe rewrite it for the next generation. So thank you for coming here and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for everything that you do. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get to your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.